All right, so uh, what I'm going to do, be looking at today is um, we're going to be talking about the history of the avant-garde, um, which is a broad topic. What we're not going to be talking about at all, really, is art or poetry or music or dance. We're going to be talking about the aspects of the avant-garde that don't have to do with that. Um, so uh, the avant-garde often is, is, is kind of used very, very vaguely as an adjective for like weird or unusual, um, which is not what I'm talking about. Um, uh, the avant-garde can be a noun which often, again, just means the stuff that's weird, which is, again, not what I'm talking about. What I'm looking at here is the, his is the avant-garde as a subculture and as a counterculture, and looking at how that's evolved over the last 200 years. Um, most of the history of the avant-garde has been given to us as art history, which is kind of weird because we're not art, we're human beings. It should be looked at as history, social history, because it's the history of the community not the history of aesthetics, which is a related but separate thing. That's kind of where I'm coming out of here. So um, my own historical work, uh, for those of you who don't know, most of you kind of do know what I do, but uh, historically, kind of started out looking at the history of the Dada movement, tracing back, OK, who were they actually looking at and being influenced by, tracing it back to early uh, French Romanticism. Um, so. Uh, the, I, you're not going to be able to read these, <laughs> but um, what I'll do, uh, I, I'll have a list after I'm done. If you want to get the lecture notes and, and, uh, and all of the, uh, the slides, I'll email those to you afterwards so you can actually spend time with all this stuff. I'm just doing a very quick survey here. So um, the first uh, use of the word avant-garde, um, in, in the sense that we talk about it today, designating a creative intellectual community, uh, was 1829. So since at least 1829, the avant-garde has been a self-conscious, self-defined counterculture um, that had been calling themselves that, among other, a lot of other names. I'm not saying that was the name, but people have been designating this for that long as, as a separate counterculture. Um, so what I have done is look through and kind of treated this not as art history, but as, as micro-history. Uh, discovering specific friend groups from 200 years ago, looking at how they organized themselves, looking at how they related to each other, looking at how they related to the following generation. And you can actually trace specific friendships from 1829 to 1970, uh, straight up lines going all throughout the history of the avant-garde. So that's kind of what this is coming out of, looking at how has our subculture changed and evolved over, the, over time. Um, uh, da, 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 da. So uh, this is partly difficult because a lot of a lot of people who say avant-garde, they think 20th century, they think futurism, or maybe symbolism if they're lucky. But when they say symbolism, they mean Alfred Jarry, um, and that's where it began. So you know, we're really the first half of, of, of this history is almost unknown to a lot of people, and a lot of it is not as obviously avant-garde because we're used to the things that they did aesthetically. So we hear Berlioz now, or we look at Delacroix, or we read, uh, well, <laughs> Théophile Gautier, we don't, but let's say that we did. It, it, they don't strike us as weird in the same way as Tristan Zara anymore, but they did in 1830. And so uh, that is one way that the social history of the avant-garde has kind of been buried by people's inability to see past aesthetics. Um, uh, so I'm kind of making recourse here to a these are just a lot of quotes from people talking about the avant-garde of the 19th century that I don't have time to read you, so give me your email. Um, uh, this is kind of coming out of a, a theory uh, from the avant-garde uh, Rémi de Gourmont, a symbolist uh, writer in the 1890s, who talks about the dissociation of ideas. The idea that you, there are ideas that we always keep together, that don't have to be together, but we have trained ourselves to think of them as the same thing. And he says, what happens when you start to dissociate ideas that have been considered as unitary? His example is military glory. You think of the military, you think of glory. This is obviously 150 years ago. But um, this is what he's saying. So what I'm saying is, can we separate art from the avant-garde and look at this part that is not art and say, OK, what is happening there of value and what has happened there for the last 200 years? 
Um, so here's kind of some core, you know, if, we, if we want to take an anthropological view of the avant-garde, here are some, some things you can say about the subculture. One, it, uh, non-utilitarian creation is a privileged cultural space. That, in other words, yes, people make poems and paintings and music a lot, more than usual, and care more than usual. That is a huge part of the counterculture, so I'm not saying that stuff is not important, but it functions socially in a way that's obviously often not looked at when people are looking at it, just how it functions uh, as if it was not being listened to within a social situation. Uh, so um, it, 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 might, it, it has a psychosociological function, I guess you could say. Um, so this is why, from the perspective of mainstream culture, it's art, or it's literature, or it's music, because that's the, the, these are what those practices mean in mainstream culture. Uh, second, uh, secondly, and, and well, actually I should say, like, you can kind of look at art in, within our community is really kind of a, sh a matter of a shared work, a shared work in an alchemical sense. It's about transformation and about putting in elements that will bring something else out. Uh, second kind of main kind of point, uh, the avant-garde works on the principle of difference and eccentricity, not similarity. This is another thing that makes it not look like a subculture necessarily to a lot of people because you can say punk rock and you've got an immediate, I know what punk rock is, of course you're wrong, but you think you do. With the avant-garde, that's not really so much the case. Um, there isn't really a single image and we can look at an avant-garde from 1840 and look at one from 1960 and they don't look the same to us in an obvious way. This is because our, this, our subculture is about constantly reinventing and recalibrating itself. Three, the avant-garde is based on the radicalization of friendship. Um, and this is something we'll be looking at very closely in a minute here. When the avant-garde was founded, its prime theoretical concept was called camaraderie. The idea that personal friendship can be um, infused with political, uh, sorry, political and emotional and personal significance and can become a transformative process. And that it can become a way to bind a community in ways that do not involve uh, uniformity, but rather involve a celebration of difference. Uh, four, individual members of this community tend to be viewed and to view themselves largely through uh, a mythic lens. We tell stories about each other. We tell stories about each other 100 years after we die. Um, you know, the, when we talk about the avant-garde, we're almost always talking about individuals. Um, and you can look at, you know, the most obvious examples would be people like Alfred Jarry or uh, Al Ackerman or um, Tristan Zara or whomever. But really, we do this with almost everybody in our community in, in, in various ways. Uh, um, five, um, as I've actually already kind of talked about this, constant and, or accelerated reinvention of social forms. The avant-garde looks into itself very... Uh, uh, as a part of what it is, and says, how can we change what we're doing, what isn't working, what is working, what has become normalized and needs to become more radicalized again. Um, and six, the avant-garde uses the intellectual resources of mainstream culture, of the dominant culture, and it uses it intentionally to create a dissenting counterculture with the mainstream culture's own materials. Um, the situation is called the Staturn. Um, so here's uh, Petrus Burrell, I'm not going to read all of that, this one's easy, Robert and Human will be here tomorrow. More punk, less rock. That's pretty much what I'm talking about here. Um, I'm using the term avant-garde because I want to use a term, because what happens otherwise I think has happened is that the uh, unifying characteristics of this very diverse set of practices uh, is easy to miss if there's not a word for it. At the same time, I'm not wanting to get into fights about what to call it. That would be idiotic. So I'm just going to call some of the other names. I'm using it as, uh, for convenience. Um, the avant-garde, I got the prose. It does kind of, so, okay, uh, <laughs> trying to fit all this into an hour and a half. So. Um, but some other words that have been used with, that, that uh, you know, you've got the avant-garde, the eternal network, which is a pretty damn good name also. Other stream culture, which I also like. Experimental writing, art, music, dance, 
I don't like that so much. Uh, a, it's rarely actually experimental. <laughs> um, uh, B, it, it remains tied to like the current cultural categories. Um, innovative writing or music, that's just more obnoxious. And there's contemporary writing and stuff, which is more obnoxious yet. So let's stick with the first three, I would say. Um, okay. Um, so, ba -ba 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 -ba. Um, yeah, so uh, looking at this idea of, of uh, inter intergenerational friendship is another thing that I've kind of picked out as a, a, a major trait of avant garde culture. People in the avant garde tend to feel a responsibility to the people who were like us before, um, to a greater extent, I think, than is the case with a lot of, a lot of subcultures. Um, and this ties in with that mythic element that I was talking about. Now, what it means is that his, uh, uh, historic, historiographic work actually can be looked at as part of that, that, that kind of personalized structure of the avant-garde, that we owe something to the dead just as we, the people who we are mentoring now will owe something to us um, to kind of keep this mission going. Uh, so, um, so it's kind of generated through that idea of a shared mission, that I can look back and say, okay, this guy who died on the street in 1843 because he was doing what I do, I'm trying to pick up that mantle and take it forward. Um, the um, practices of reading, mythologizing, historiography, again, are, tend to be very personalized. Um, and a lot of the writing practices and things that you have here in the avant-garde also do this. When you're, you see people doing hacks, people doing epigraphs, people using other people's work in contemporary work, collaborating with the dead, essentially. Which I think is an interesting way to think about that. A lot of us are collaborating with the dead in various ways. Um, so, let's see here. Um, so we can look at the avant-garde in a sense as a, 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 an affinity group or a, a group of affinity groups who are applying their passions, very unusual passions which are not going to arise from mainstream culture and are applying those to every aspect of life and trying to discover new facets or new strategies from that. Um, they tend to be grouped into very extremely self-conscious, reflexive kind of social groupings. Um, a lot of avant-garde you know, friend groups have names like Dada or whatever, much more than you typically have in other subcultures, lore of the mainstream. Um, they tend to intersect on multiple levels, so there will be very, in, very intimate kind of interpersonal connections, you'll have kind of local communities that have their own kind of identities, and then overarching international communities or networks that uh, affect and are affected by all of those different local communities. Um, <clears throat> the concept of a temporary autonomous zone, I think, is interesting here. And what I'm putting forward is not exactly an idea of the avant-garde as a temporary autonomous zone, because it's not actually temporary. Um, what I'm talking about really is a tradition of constantly creating new temporary autonomous zones. The idea of a, a temporary autonomous zone is that power is always going to win ultimately because power has time on its side. But if you want to try to create a space of freedom, you can do it within the interstices of power. You can do it in the places that power doesn't think is important because it's not paying as much attention. And then you do that, eventually power figures out what's going on, they appropriate it, and you have to slip into some new practice. Um, so there's a sense you can look at the avant-garde as a tradition of constantly reinventing new temporary autonomous zones. As, one, as soon as one is shut down, we find another one. And we have unified uh, strategies and historical memory to help us to navigate how all of that happens. Um, So in this lecture, I'm going to be really concentrating primarily on one aspect, which is the forms of social organization. There's way too much to cover to just give every single aspect of the entire, uh, of the entire uh, history. Um, so 
want to take a look at first some of the early social forms that were inherited by the early avant-garde. I'm going to be talking a lot about the early origins because it's almost completely unknown to us now, as opposed to Dada, Surrealism, Fluxus, which will get a little bit shorter shrift because half of us in the audience already know as much as I do about these things. So, um, so yeah, so you have uh, the Republic of Letters, which was around kind of 16th century through the 20th century. This is basically an extended mail network of intellectuals of all kinds who constantly circulated work throughout Europe. And this is the way that most intellectual work, and especially large intellectual projects, were done. Um, and so this, was, this spanned nations, it spanned languages, it spanned disciplines, it was not bound by nationalism, which I think is important. Um, it's... Uh, yeah, and, and it, it kind of created this idea of, of, of a family of intellectuals. And intellectuals and artists start thinking of themselves as a form of family, as opposed to uh, people with a similar job. Um, they would meet through the mail, but they would also then design tours to combine research, move out throughout Europe, meeting up with different people they were in correspondence with in order to, uh, to you know, do whatever it was that they were trying to do. It was mainly aristocratic middle class because they were all intellectuals and it was in the 18th century. It was relatively open to women for the time for being in the 18th century. Um, started to open up some of these things. Huge influence on people like Erasmus, Thomas More, Descartes, Voltaire, Mary Wollstonecraft, Thomas Paine, De Stael, a lot of cultural radicals. Freemasonry is another one which was huge in the 18th century. Secret society, which again, class does not matter, and nation does not matter. Um, women are not allowed. Um, the, the, uh, there tended to be a liberal bias in the 18th century within uh, the um, Masonic organizations, which isn't surprising, considering that, again, there were classes-ish, um, as, again, as much as they can be for the time. Um, let me see. Uh, and, and in fact, the early avant-garde, there were actually, you, you can find people complaining about the Jeune France, saying that they come to salons, we can't understand what they're talking about because of their Masonic speech, which is the, the, the specialized slang I'll be talking about later. Um, so that is a big, a big kind of influence. Salons are a huge influence and remain a huge part of, of avant-garde culture throughout the 19th century. Traditionally, most salons are organized by women in their homes, and so this brings intellectual work into a domestic context, into the context of everyday life. And again, you actually have a situation where the majority of early avant-garde organizers were female. They don't get any credit for it because the books about them were written by 19th century men. But, as we'll see, most of them were women. Um, usually healthy, but anybody educated was welcome to come. So, Predominantly aristocratic, but not, but basically it was the aristocracy of the mind that got you into a salon. It was money that let you put it on. Um, so these were, and these are basically regular, usually every week events, you, people's families and people's social uh, connections, focused conversation. It's like you come in and you're going to converse like a motherfucker. Like you don't just hang out and talk. This is the idea. Um, uh, and so you're talking, and then interspersed with this, people are sharing poetry, they're playing music, they're showing artwork that they're working on. All of these things are combined and kind of mashed together. You're not, it's not a gallery. It's not a poetry reading. It's people hanging out and all these things being integrated into their daily lives and into their conversation. Um, and it had people from all of the disciplines. You would have chemists talking to poets, not just an artist talking to poets and across the political divide. You would have ultra-monarchists talking to socialists every day or every week in these salons. And so there was a lot, it was a very, very good um, situation for new ideas to be formed. Um, journals and presses that have a specific kind of focus are started to become a nuclei for communities that would form around them. Um, this is, again, primarily over the course of the 18th century. Um, and then the 19th century is when all this stuff kind of comes together. Um, um, and so these journals and presses would become the points of contact where the community, the actual subculture of the avant-garde comes into contact with the mainstream culture. Um, and then, uh, 
Goguettes and clubs. The Goguette was a French singing club, and these were huge in the early 19th century. Um, people get together, and they just they sing songs together, and they eat, and they drink, they be merry. Um, and, uh, and again, these were, these were accepting of a very wide variety of class backgrounds. Again, not so much with women, although some of them did allow women. Um, uh, like, again, a lot, of, a lot of them actually had fairly political, political orientations. So they were liberal, Republican, or Republican at that time, meaning radical left, <laughs> uh, ultra monarchist, everything. Um, and, uh, and, and this is probably where a lot of the early avant-garde groups called themselves clubs. This is probably where they got that club from, was actually the go-get singing clubs, is what, probably what was in their mind. And then utopian socialism, um, mainly St. Simonism and Fourierism, this is pre-Marxist stuff. Utopian socialism is intensely feminist, way more than Marx, infinitely more than Marx. Um, it is... Um, often more naive than Marx in its uh, analysis. Um, but they were trying to really address everything at once and say, how do we change all of life so that everything's coordinated? And then uh, how do we create that world on a smaller scale and microcosm in the real world rather than just waiting for the revolution to come and help us out biblically? And so this is their idea. And so you really can see the avant-garde looking at this and saying, okay, yeah, we can create a little utopia, a little utopia. Uh, and they uh, also wore crazy little costumes to make sure you knew that they were Saint Simonists. Um, again, if you guys want to move closer, I know this is really tiny. You are welcome to. Um, so that also we're going to see this kind of like, I want everybody to know what my ideology is from the scarf I'm wearing is going to come into play with French Romanticism, which I'm going to talk about now. Okay, English Romanticism uh, is the one that most people are kind of relatively familiar with. Um, uh, French Romanticism, interestingly, is even when you read books on Romanticism, typically French Romanticism gets about three pages. And they're like, uh, it happened really late, and they were all, uh, they all went overboard. Victor Hugo was one of them. And you're like, okay, thanks for that, I guess. I'm glad you gave me 200 pages on English Romanticism. Um, so French Romanticism, I suspect that's because French Romanticism scares the hell out of scholars and academics because it's so radical. They don't know what to do with it. Also, they have no sense of irony. You cannot deal with Romanticism without a healthy sense of irony. So, um, basically, what French Romanticism was, it is, it does come later, that means it's self-identified. The English Romantics didn't call themselves Romantics. Byron said, I probably am not one, when he was talking about the French. The Germans did use the word Romanticism, but the French are the only ones who said, we're romantics. This is the romanticist uh, movement. We want to create a romanticist world. All hail romanticism. Fuck you if you don't like romanticism. I'm a romanticist. Um, so it's interesting they get left out of the books on romanticism, being the only ones who were. Um, so they were articulate. They were very heavily organized. They had a definite plan that they were all on board with, and they knew how they were going to try to achieve it, which is why it worked. Um, so, um, it, and it was really a movement. They were attempting to move or affect a part of mainstream society. And this is, I'm going to get into this dynamic. You have movements, and then you also have like, networks, which are more inward turning, and are not necessarily trying to change everything. They're trying to maintain a space of freedom for themselves, and not necessarily have to explain everything to people who don't want to hear it. Um, and so, but the Romanticism was very much a movement in that regard. Um, the influence of the French Academy and the Napoleonic cultural kind of installationism is, is something we really need to bear in mind because there's nothing like it in Anglophone history. Um, up until uh, 1830, um, it was, Romanticism literally could not be produced on the stage. Um, it was illegal. Um, and so this was a movement that was really very much fighting act, even against like a lot of, of, of codes and institutions in order to do what they wanted to do. 
Um, so, let's see here. So Romanticisms in France started out as a youth subculture. It reminds me of nothing more than, than punk in, in the 70s. Um, it, uh, it's a mil it's a, it's mil militant Romanticism. It gets kicked off by Hugo's preface to Cromwell in 1819. The play doesn't get produced because it involves the king being killed in a situation where a lot of people want to kill the king. But the preface it becomes, is published and becomes the manifesto of radical romanticism. Um, the movement develops basically from adolescents who were reading romanticist literature that was like barely legal in the 1820s, grew up reading that. They become teenagers, they start writing it, and they start making connections with people. Um, the really intellectually promising ones ended up being mentored in the salons, the romanticist salons, and becoming a part of the community in that way. Um, usually, in, with the Romantics, those mentors did not give them much help once it came to actually getting published, however. You kind of see this pattern, like, oh, you like my work? That's so great, and take you under my wing, and oh, you want to get that weird thing with vampires published by my publisher? You can ask them. <laughs> you know, so you do have this kind of thing going on, which later on changes, but for this generation it does not. And that actually ends up with a lot of early avant-gardists dying on the street in poverty or committing suicide because they just could not get their work out. Um, let me see. Uh, the most radical of these people were not willing to just stop at reading novels and poems. They wanted to romanticize every aspect of life. And so this is where it really starts to become a counterculture. Um, the, the, if you take apart the word romanticism, the root word is roman in French, novel, fiction. So technical, the, the technical definition of romanticism is fictionalism. The idea that I want to live my life according to fiction, not according to reality. And that this is a way to change reality by basically throwing a grappling hook outside of reality and then hauling reality toward it. Um, so this is, and this is where the avant-garde comes from. And they start being called the avant-garde of romanticism because they were the ones who were willing to like basically throw themselves on the bayonets so that the next generation would have a little bit more freedom. Um, so, and there were, so in Paris by 1830, there were hundreds of self-declared romanticist youth in, uh, in Paris. There was a whole, a whole community. Um, and um, they were not all fine artists. There were romanticist typographers, romanticist tailors, romanticist chefs, romanticist architects, romanticist jewelers. They tried to address every aspect of society. Um, the most public expression, if you want people to know you are romantic, naturally, is going to be fashion. How do you dress? The romantics loved romanticist colors. The romanticist colors were bright colors, red, dark, uh, uh, bright blue, yellow, green, all of these colors which you were not supposed to, only the aristocrats had ever worn these colors, and we're moving into a bourgeois era. Um, they would do a very, you know, they liked really crazy patterning. The zigzag is a romanticist innovation. The zigzag comes out of French romanticism, including the word, um, although the zig zoo initially. Um, they liked broad, loose collars, wide-brimmed hats, very colorful waistcoats, never wore top hats. Those are for the bourgeoisie. Um, they loved cosplay. This, you can actually take the, trace the roots of cosplay back to 1829. The romantics would go out into the street dressed in historical costume. Like, I'm going to dress as a 17th century cavalier because cavaliers are sweet. I'm going to dress like you know, an archer from the Middle Ages, or their favorite characters. I'm going to dress up as a Goethe character. I'm going to dress up as a Shakespeare character and go out into the street. They wore beards and long hair. They'd been over a hundred years before anybody in the middle or upper classes had worn beards or long hair before. And this was, some of them actually spent time in jail for wearing beards and long hair because it was against some of the city codes. Uh, they also had a special romanticist haircut, which was called the Flame of Glory which is basically, you just take your hair, and you somehow get it, it's a, it's a faux hawk. But they called it the Flame of Gold Glory, which is a much better name. Um, da -da 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 -da. 
And they, and if there were enough of them that you actually had microcultures within this. It's like they didn't just have heavy metal, they had black metal and death metal. So within uh, Romanticism, you had medievalist romantics, and that was, everything was romanticized in a medievalist way. You had uh, orientalist uh, romantics, both of them probably kind of self-explanatory. Frenetic romantics, who were gothic, like gothic horror mixed with socialism. It doesn't get better than that. Um, uh, Bouzanjo, who were uh, kind of bohemian, radical, political, kind of Jacobins, all of them within that romanticist orbit. Um, for what it's worth, or Orientalist romanticism is where we get shawls. Shawls were worn by, uh, by Orientalist romanticist woman in the 1830s, imported from Egypt, where apparently, at least according to 1830s sources, which take that with a grain of salt, originally was headgear, and then they started wearing them around their shoulders instead. Um, and so, apparently, that's where we get shawls from. Uh, the medievalist romantics were part of the first anti-gentrification anti campaigns. Notre Dame was going to be torn down because it was an eyesore, because they didn't look nice and clean and neat according to neoclassicist standards. The, and the romantics wrote a number of novels all at once in the same year about Notre Dame. Of course, one of those is now famous. Um, in order to convince normal French people that they should not tear down romantic or not tear down medieval buildings, and it worked. Um, that's, that's why we still have medieval ruins in France. Uh, this all comes together in the Battle of Hernani, uh, which is what it was called within the avant-garde. For over a hundred years, people would talk about the Battle of Hernani. Basically what this was, Hugo is putting on a play called Hernani. It, it, lots of politics to even get it on stage that I'm not going to go over. The classicists, are, uh, are, who are basically the representatives of mainstream culture at this point, are planning on destroying it. Like, there are people within the board of the theater who are leaking stuff to the press so that classicist newspapers can make fun of a play and destroy it before it even gets shown. The romantics in the meantime are saying, okay, newspapers are suddenly a new thing. I think this media thing is something we could probably use. And what they realize is that all publicity is good publicity. And so they're like, oh, so you've, you've got all these stereotypes about how the romantics act. Okay, we can act like that, trust me. And so everybody knows there's going to be a riot at this play. A, a month, two months out, everybody knows there's going to be a riot. And it's basically been decided by everybody that whoever wins this riot, is going to de that, that is going to determine whether romanticism gets a place in the cultural map or not. Um, 300 romantics show up, dressed up in full romanticist regalia that day, and there, is, there are pitched, pitched battles in the theater, people are getting beat up, the romanticists, the romanticists win. They go back every performance for two months. There's this battle, there is fighting in the stalls almost every night. At the end of it, the romanticists have kind of come out on top. This is why romanticism feels like a mainstream thing now. Um, so what they're doing here is they're basically taking they're coming out of an intensely militaristic society. These people grew up under Napoleon, or they were at least born under Napoleon, and grew up under the stories about how awesome Napoleon was. And now here's France, got England's boot on the top of it. So they, they tour in this. They, they say, okay, militarism, let's switch this around. We're going to make it cultural militantism. We'll organize ourselves like an army, because armies do know how to get things done, but we're not going to kill people. We're going to try to improve culture instead. And so this is what they do. So they start doing military thinking. They're thinking strategically. How do we mobilize our forces? Their organization is based on the units of an army, uh, but also on this idea of friendship. Every little friend group is its own unit, and they amalgamate into larger units until you get to the top of the, until the, top of the heap. Here's a picture of, some, picture of that riot. This guy's got a flame of glory. Another one with another flame of glory. So here is the way that it's organized. Victor Hugo is on top. He went to the kind of most prominent uh, guys in the Romanticist youth community, Gerard de Nerval and Petrus Burrell, and he says, yo, you guys know everybody, right? 
We're going to sit down with the script of the play and go over every line, and we're going to figure out which lines the romantic, which lines the classicists are going to most hate, and we're going to basically come up with a strategy to counter them at every at every move. They plan the whole thing out. They go out and they talk to all of the most like hardcore romantics they know, and they go, "Hey, y'all, you know at least six guys who are willing to like get beat up for romanticism, right?" And the guy's like, "Yeah, totally. I can get six guys who are willing to do." All right, cool. Well, look, here are the notes. Learn this play by heart so you know what's coming. And these are our plans. And he gives it to them. They go to their friend group. They get them all over. They hang out. And they're like, all right, yo, guys, this is what we're going to do. And they go over it line by line. Intensely, intensely planned out. And again, it worked. But what comes out of this is that um, an intense kind of feeling of camaraderie comes out of this experience. Because, I mean, that's going to be an intense experience. You've got like 2,000 people here in the middle of a riot for two hours that you plan. And so the people have gone through this night after night after night. They come out of it and they've changed. And they're like, okay, we can't just go back to, oh, I'll just hang out and read poetry in my house. That can't be romanticism after this. It has to be more. Um, and so the people who came out of that, who really recognized, like, all right, that guy is serious. That guy is serious. They get together and they're like, all right, we need to push this farther. And this is where the avant-garde actually comes from. So, um, so this is where you get this idea of camaraderie, uh, which basically is uh, the idea of, of camaraderie basically in this initially an insult, and then like it always happens within the avant-garde, they're like, all right, cool, that's what I am then, I'll take that word. Um, mainstream romantics were like, no, I'm not part of camaraderie, I'm a, I'm a legitimate, I'm not about friendship, I'm about literature. It's so this specifically the avant-garde who espouse it. Um, it's radicalized friendship, it's a fusion of intellectual, social, and daily life, that mythologization I was talking about, the Three Musketeers was written by a guy named uh, Auguste Maquette, not Alexandre Dumas. He ghost wrote. Um, Maquette was a member of the first avant-garde group. So this idea, one for all and all for one, he's actually describing camaraderie. He's describing romanticist, com uh, a romanticist synagogue, but putting it into this historical context. Um, that's really kind of all for one, one for all. Is really kind of, of, of camaraderie in a nutshell. Um, and mutual support, this idea of like mutual challenge and mutual support. We're, they are pushing themselves to do things that actually give them a very real chance of driving themselves mad, which happened to, for instance, Gerard de Robal. He pushed too hard. Um, and so a part of what they were doing was uh, providing the support for that to happen, both providing the support to push for that challenge and the support to survive the attempt to meet that challenge. Um, so, um, I'm not going to go over all of this, but actually I'm going to kind of skip this one. Uh, give me your email if you want it. This is just looking at the, the, the way that you kind of had the, the, the Petit, petit Senac, which was the first avant-garde group that I found that called itself that. Um, basically started out as two or three different Senacs that kind of merged and over the course of about 18 months into this kind of avant-garde super team. Um, I'm going to skip some of these two because there's no way you can read that. Uh, so you have the Synox, and the Synox I'm going to talk about a lot more. You also have, still have salons going on. So these are some of the major romanticist salon, uh, salon organizers. Um, again, like I said, if you look at this, you'll note almost all but two of them are women. Although also two of those women often dressed as men. But uh, you do have those two men. And so this is another thing. And you can look at this, I think, probably one of two ways. You can look at it as romanticist men being a little bit more willing to take on feminine social traits. Or you can look at it as men colonizing the, the, the kind of domestic realm, which is the only realm women are allowed at this time. You can kind of look at that either way. But still, the majority of them were women. Um, Sophie Hayes started an early romanticist salon. Her daughter ran another one a generation later. 
Um, Charles Nodier had a daughter who also was a poet and also ran her own salon after helping him with his. Um, uh, so so you, 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 you do have kind of that going on. Here's some of the romant important romances in the synops, or I guess the English would be cynical. Um, we don't have names for most of them. We only, there are only a few of them that have really been preserved. Um, a cynical was familial. It was, it was kind of a close-knit kind of clan. Uh, most of them, or at least a lot of them, were originated in, in, in like school friend groups. A lot of them had gone to school together, or at least some, you know, maybe half of a cynical had all gone to the same school or something like that. Um, uh, some of them were even based on kind of shadow schools that had been, that had happened at the high schools they were at where people would kind of go and start their own little classes against the, the, the official classes, which the Phil Philotheo Neddy did. Um, the, some of them had connections with more established romanticist salons, some of them did not. Um, structurally, they had porous borders. There were people who maybe you could make an argument are or are not a member of, of, of one of these groups, but they, the core group was pretty identifiable. Um, and uh, it tended to be like a very, a very identifiable core group and then kind of satellite people who were kind of uh, more or less close to that kind of core group. Two different ways that this has been described, well, interestingly, by two people in the same group disagreeing about its own structure. Um, according to Theophile Gautier, a Sanag had a son, one person whose charisma was so strong that it really unified the entire group. And he says, for instance, in the Petit Sanag, that it was Petrus Burrell. Philoteo Neddy, his friend, says, no, that's not true. Actually, uh, there were about four or five of us who were actually all really involved with organizing it. And so he says it's really kind of more of a, a group of motivators, inner core of motivators, as opposed to a single kind of dominant personality. Um, so here are some of the core members of the Senat group. The, the, this is the, not the Petit Senat, this is the Senat group. These are the mainstream romantics that plan that Hernani battle. And then the Petit Senat were like, oh, we're like a little version of you guys. But they were actually way more radical. Here's the social structure of the Jude France where I was just talking about. So I've gone with Onetti's version here, uh, where you have these kind of four organizers. They were the people who often owned the houses where everybody met, and they were the ones who were kind of the, the, just the go-getters who made everything happen. Then you have kind of the inner circle of the people who you could always depend to be there on everything. They were always going to be there. They're always going to be like hardcore. And you've got people who are kind of more peripheral to it, but are definitely members of the group. And you have various people around it who hang out all the time with the group, but maybe not specifically within the like group context. Um, so, ba -ba -ba -ba. so you have this. A lot of the glue that holds this subculture together then is collaboration. And that was actually almost as true in 1830 as it is now, although there are very different ways of collaborating. Um, collaboration is a way to meld the creative and the personal worlds of the members, and to meld their psychologies as well, and their symbolic kind of ways that they're thinking. And when you consider the way that you use your material as an artist is very intimately connected with every aspect of how you think. Um, and so, you know, this is always about friendship. Um, and it was valued as collaboration, not only for what it could produce. One really good example of this is the fact that the first noise concerts I'm aware of were put on by the Romantics. The Petit Sainat, which is also called, I'm sorry, I have to keep doing this. This group, like a lot of avant-garde groups, changed their name four times. Starts out as Petit Sainat, they change their orientation a bit, like one guy drops out, it becomes the June Fronts. Then the Bouz Anjou, then back to the June Fronts. So, also, two of them are misspelled intentionally, but I won't get into that. But the June Fronts had concerts at their house where they all got a bunch of broken instruments from uh, essentially like you know, thrift shops, junk shops, and would have concerts where they would just play. And the only rule was that if you started to act as if you had learned your instrument at all, you had to give it up and trade it. So they were like, this has to sound bad. It's only about the collaboration. Um, so, um, yeah. Uh, so you, you had this 
you know, all of these, you know, all of these advantages to collaboration. Um, there's actually a lot of direct collaboration. They were writing a lot of plays together, a lot of poems and novels together. Almost none of those have been published, and the manuscripts are gone. So we don't know what most of this collaboration looked like. The thing is, collaboration, they were, they were doing collaborative writing in a context where the publishing industry was not interested in that. And so all of this kind of you know, foundation of the community is gone. Um, so, yeah. Um, and they had a lot of interdisciplinary and indirect collaboration too. So visual artists were doing portraits, they'd illustrate people's stories, they would do costume design, set designs. Writers would do criticism of other discipline stuff. They would write odes to people, use epigraphs from other people's work. They would do descriptions in their work of paintings and sculptures by their friends. Um, you know, all kinds of things like this. Translation. Musicians would write, song, would write songs to go with lyrics that poets had written. They would write tone poems. They would uh, do musical adaptations of plays. Uh, they would do the incidental music for plays. Uh, playwrights would adapt people's novels, hire the composers to do the thing I just said. Working with actors obviously goes with that. <laughs> so, um, and actors, in addition to playing whatever roles they are, would also declaim poems in, theater, in, in theaters and things like that. So, a lot of, of just ways of trying to support each other's work. Um, okay, what did it mean to be an avant-gardist between 1830 and 1845? Um, I'm going to skip that for now. Um, okay, so, you've got, first off, romanticist language and slang. The Romantics had its intense slang. Each little subgroup, every Seneca, would develop its own system of slang, which would get so intense that they would go to salons and other Romantics would not be able to understand their conversations because it was so deeply coded. Um, so this is something really, and if you look at their poetry, and if, especially if you try to translate their poetry, you're like, yeah, okay, I can see how you got here. Because they, they, they're playing language games every moment of their lives. Um, um, this is where people talk about their Masonic jargon when they would piss them off. Certain words would just develop kind of talismanic social meanings, almost like spells. They would often use slang drawn from medieval street slang, like from Villon, Rabelais. Um, they would do stuff from archaic French, put archaic conjugations on modern French words, stuff like that. Um, or bringing, language, bringing words in from other languages. There was a set of romanticist letters. So if you really wanted to show you were romantic, you use the letters K and W as much as you possibly can. Y and H are also great. And when you come up with your, your pseudonym, because you can't really be a romanticist without a pseudonym, you better have an us at the end if you possibly can, and then use as many diphthongs as possible. And then you got a good romanticist word. Um, uh, so, yeah, and so the, 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 this language was a way of kind of poeticizing daily life, making daily life like fiction. Um, romanticist paradox, so one of their favorite games. You just throw out something that you can't possibly defend, some ridiculous statement, and you just dig in and you defend it using the most messed up logic against itself you possibly can. This is pretty much the root of what ends up becoming pataphysics at the end of the century with Alfred Jarry because this remains a part of avant-garde subculture throughout the 19th century. Um, living arrangements. Most of the romantics were living in roommate situations with other people in their groups. Also, a number of them were homeless or semi-homeless, and so part of being a part of a romantic subculture was always having a sofa for somebody to stay on. Especially people like Gerard de Nerval, who did eventually end up committing suicide. But it was 20 years of his friends trying and trying and trying and trying to help him before that finally happened, um, living kind of semi-transient. Um, uh, da, 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 da. You usually are going to live in the suburbs because that was where the cheap housing was at the time because this is before you, know, you have to walk to the center of the city. So suburbs were actually more expensive at that time, or cheaper at that time. Um, certain homes will become kind of a headquarters for the, sub, for the cynical, for the group. They're like clubhouses. Um, and they, that is where that, that merger of domestic life, social life, intellectual life really happens. So the home and the studio serves a lot of social and conceptual and psychological purposes. Um, it reinforces that idea of camaraderie. It, is, um, you, it, it's, it basically shows other people who come to your events what 
your cynical means? What is it to live in this way, with this, within this like, realm of experimentation? Um, it, it, it responds to the ideological and strategic kind of goals of the, of the group. For instance, in the Tartar camp, which is one of the June France's um, uh, homes, the whole the idea was like, oh, we're barbarians, so we're not going to have chairs. They did not supply chairs in their house. They did supply tents in the garden, though, for their homeless members of the community. Um, but no chairs for anybody. Uh, so, you know, things like that. Um, and it, it, what you end up doing is creating basically a thought chamber that the community lives inside, which gradually, every moment of the day, is changing your psychology and changing the social and group dynamic a little bit. So, for example, some of the important poems, uh, Jihon de Senor's studio was the first place where these, this group met, just in the back of a fruit shop. It's, I mean, they, these were, they didn't have any more money than any of us. Um, and then the Tartar camp, which we just talked about with the chairs, they had murals all over the house, medallion sculptures of every member of the group on the wall. Um, um, and then you had uh, the Rue d'Enfer, their house on Hell Street, which was right across the street from the convent where the Marquis de Sade's mother had died, and one block away from the uh, entrance to the Paris catacombs. So really perfect place for a frenetic, gothic, horror, romanticist group to live. Um, they would also each choose like, a favorite like, restaurant or cafe. For the Jeune France, it was Graziano's uh, Italian restaurant. And they would just hang out there all the time. Usually it was foreign food, because you're a romantic, you don't want normal food. Um, usually cheap, working class kind of places. And if you could find any literary, historical, symbolic associations, so much the better. The reason they went to Graziano's is because all the artists in the group liked drawing his face so much. So it became their hangout. Just the guy who owned it. Um, but then you would also have like, huge romanticist feasts. So their feasts would have themed menus um, and a huge cosplay element, so and role-playing elements. So you would come, you would be playing a particular character from a book during this meal that was coordinated with the theme of the food and all of this stuff. Um, and then there would be, they'd have like poetry readings integrated into it, music integrated into it. So there were almost, almost weirdly like kind of happenings in the 20th century in a certain, in a certain way. Romanticist gastronomy was really important to them. Oh, here's those Romanticist letters, sorry. Um, this was the first celebrity chef, was a Romanticist chef named Alexis Soyer. I, went through like 30 pages of stuff on him. I cannot find anything about his actual food, but he did popularize zigzags. So there was that. Um, yeah, this is a, uh, a romanticist um, food journal called The Gastronome, which was published and edited by Alexandre Dumas. Um, you, if you were going to become a romantic avant-gardist, you needed to be initiated. For instance, the June France had initiation ceremony of drinking wine out of a human skull, which is a reference to a Victor Hugo novel, which is a reference to a Lord Byron story. A story about stuff Lord Byron actually did. Um, you are going to be scouring junk dealers as much as possible. That is one thing that's never changed in avant-garde subculture, is you go to the thrift shop all the time to look for cheap junk. Mm -hmm. And you put it on a shelf, and you're like, I don't know why that's there, but it is, and it will be for the next 20 years. This is where that started. There was a piece of leather. Again, the painter is just like, this is a beautiful piece of leather. Look, at 2 o'clock in the afternoon, you put it right here, look at the sun on there. So it's just hanging out this scrap of leather that somebody bought for a quarter. But it becomes this kind of talisman for the community. Um, this eventually ends up becoming the ready-made. Some of you may remember my tirade against Duchamp and his invention of the ready-made. Um, this is where it actually starts, isn't around 1830. Um, so they present themselves as, re as rebellious youth. They're ironically and intentionally juvenile in how they act. They're rowdy, they're disrespectful. You know, they're like, we're gonna act like fucking teenagers is really kind of how they're, how they're acting. They're also, these are also the people who are being trained to run the country and are refusing to do it. So they know what they're doing, but they're doing it. Um, and a lot of public interventions and pranks. So for instance, Gerard de Nerval would walk a lobster around on a leash, apparently. 
there's a lot of debate over whether that's actually technically possible or not. Um, the booze on Joe got a hold of a uh, dressmaker's dummy and threw dirt on it and, and, and some old sheets. And then they got smeared dirt on their faces and they just like dragged it through the streets of Paris shouting out to everybody that they had just dug a corpse up out of the, uh, out of the graveyard. Because why not? So that's kind of how you act if you're going to be romantic. Um, their correspondence would usually combine drawings or cartoons along with text and a lot of that slang and using code names for each other and stuff like that. So you might read something, a note that's actually, I'm using an actual example, a note that's actually saying, hey, you should come get dinner. Me and my friends are, are going to have dinner on Thursday. You should come. It's going to be at 7. And you read it and you're like, what weird medieval story is this about with the what, who's going on? Because it's, it's everything's so coded. So you're just having fun with everything there. Um, dances, romanticist dances. The romantics got arrested a lot for doing illegal dances, um, such as the can-can, which was originally a romanticist dance, which they, a number of them got arrested for doing a number of times. The kachuka, which is a version of it. The fandango, which is way too sexual. Uh, hence they're liking it. And in more than anything, this called the Infernal Gallop, which we actually did one up here two years ago at Aftermath. We did an Infernal Gallop. The Infernal Gallop, I'm going to describe it and see if it sounds familiar, but this is 1830. Everybody gets a line and you run around in a circle as fast as you can. And if somebody trips, they just get walked over. The only difference between the Infernal Gallop and a circle pit is the fact that in the Infernal Gallop, you're also shooting pistols into the air to keep time. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, so that's how you dance if you're a romantic. They had huge, uh, well not huge, by huge I mean awesome, small, intense events in their houses, um, which were essentially happenings, uh, but they, were, they called them romanticist orgies, which is a way better name. Um, and so, for instance, one famous romanticist orgy, everybody has to come in romanticist costumes. And then they had ice cream, which is hard to get in 1830. They're serving ice cream out of human skulls. And they've got a huge bowl of punch, which they set on fire. And then when the flames burn down, everybody drinks it. And it was apparently so strong that people just started, they, well, they then went into the infernal gallop, shooting pistols into the ceiling in their house until people started passing out from a combination of heat, alcohol poisoning, and overexcitement, and they had to set up a triage station in the basement. So you do this kind of thing every so often. What you're trying to reach is what they would call romanticist frenzy, which is a state where everybody in the room just kind of goes crazy together. A lot of us in this room, given the makeup of our people here, have probably experienced stuff like that before. It's one of those things that scholars cannot understand. They look at like, these people were fucking idiots. It's like, yeah, you've never been there, man. <laughs> Um, all of this. So there are a lot of things even at this early stage that I think really feel very familiar to a lot of us. I've talked about the noise concerts, phonetic parties, okay. Um, there was not a lot of friction generally between these little groups. Like the fact that you're in this group and that person is in that group is a cause for celebration. It, it's, it's not, there's not typically a lot of confrontation between them. There's more collaboration. Um, however, the strife between the mainstream romantics and the avant-garde between 1830 and 1834 got very big because the, the mainstream romantics not had careers to look after and having these people acting this way is not helping. And so by 1835, we're talking five years after the Battle of Hernani, the avant-garde is becoming separate in, as a community from romanticism, um, although it's ideologically still romantic. Uh, so, and you start to get just a little bit of DIY culture with the romantics. This is the earliest DIY, like kind of proto-zine that I'm aware of. This is um, a romanticist uh, zine basically by Alphonse Carr from 1839 called The Wasps, the And um, it, was, it was printed, privately printed, not actually published, um, on a subscription because he, he was able to privately distribute it and say things that he was not, could not legally say about politics uh, if he was to actually sell it in bookstores. Okay, 
Simultaneously with Romanticism, you have dandyism coming up. Um, so dandyism, very briefly, is um, what it looks like is based with people who are really, really, I'm so far behind, people who are really, really, really into um, uh, fashion. That's kind of the worst version of it. But, um, so it's, it's, it was started in England, and there it really was just all fashion. Um, when and and it's, there are still a lot of just old school dandies, which is basically, if you're this kind of dandy, your goal in life is to show people how much money you have by what you can wear, and show them that you also have enough subtle taste that you're not going to show it off, because no one's going to know that this material on this vest costs this much unless they also can afford to buy this vest. And that's the idea. With the French, uh, and you still have that. So by in 1861, the first time that, that Wagner's Tannhauser was performed in Paris, it got booed down by the Jockey Club, which was the big dandiest organization, because it, uh, the way that the, the play or that the opera was arranged interfered with their being able to leave in time to go eat dinner at their usual time. And so they basically made sure that Wagner wouldn't be playing again in Paris for another decade. So they were kind of dicks. Um, but uh, the Romanticists, when they became dandies, did something else. And they romanticized what it was. Baudelaire talks about dandyism as being about discipline, not about fashion. He's like, yes, there's the fashion, but the fashion is just the thing you practice on. It's all about controlling your personality and changing who you are, which is a more interesting take on it, which is really what the French were doing. Here are some of the important uh, French dandies, including Théophile Gautier, who we've already seen in the, the Jeune France, and we will see a lot more of him. He is one of the most important people in the early avant-garde, in terms of our community still existing today. Um, so their fashion, so yeah, they, they, first off, these are not rich people. Most of them destroy themselves financially within about 10 years or less living this lifestyle. Um, so there's depths within depths that we uh, don't, don't, can't get into right now of what makes a person live like that. But, um, but yeah, but the, the dandies are, yeah, like avoiding creditors becomes a part of the lifestyle of being a dandy. Um, it's almost like living in a squat or something. But um, their fashion is never, the, never bourgeois, and they actually do want people to notice. They want people to be like, how's that guy dressed? That's crazy. Um, they're, not looking to, they're not looking for subtle recognition. So like Baudelaire wore a green wig, for instance, around, you know, in 18, this is like 1860s. This is pretty uncommon. Um, they, uh, they do start wearing monocles, which monocles become symbols within the avant-garde at this point. Um, for kind of self-changing one's identity or having that dandiest aspect in what you do. You'll see this all the way up through Fluxus. Um, ba -ba 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 -ba. The, so a big part of, of, of dandiest life was, was being a flaneur, flanori, which basically means you're roaming, just roaming around the city, people watching. Sometimes you'll pick a certain person and just follow them for a couple hours, see what their life is like, and then you'll see this person, follow them. The idea is like almost, it's almost like hunting in a weird way in an urban context, or like kind of trying to understand all of the intricacies of, of ur urbanism, I guess, as it's really emerging. Um, the met in salons, dinners, parties, but they lived much more isolated lifestyles than the Romantics did. They did not have roommates if they could help it, um, if they could help it, you know. Um, they did really enjoy pranks. For instance, Roger de Beauvoir, this guy one time, there was a classicist play being performed at the theater, and it was pouring rain outside. So he spent what must have been like three months worth of his like, income to hire every single cab right at the end of the play and send them away so that all of the rich people came, rich classicists came out of the theater and got rained on because there were no taxis in the city left. George Matutis wanted to do the same performance, interestingly, in the 1960s, but it was too radical for the group. They said, no, we'll get in trouble. Um, so, uh, so kind of interesting. Um, so this become, whoop, becomes a big part of Romantic subculture with the Bohème Doyenne group, which is a later Romanticist group after that June France group falls apart. As you can see, some of these are the same people from that group forming a new group. 
Some of them who are more in the center of the other group, like Nantuil, is now more on the periphery. Petrus Burrell is like almost out here where he was in the middle before. So you see these just kind of reconstellations of people. But then, and, and you'll see sometimes historically, people will say like, oh, there was a huge fight, Gautier and Burrell, you know, Gautier did a power grab from Burrell. And the, people want this kind of drama. Burrell was hanging out there. Gautier got him a job during this period. They were not angry at each other. They were just hanging out in a different way. Um, so the Bohème Doyenne is kind of a merger of Romanticism and Dandyism. The, their, fashion, it's their fashion is toned down from Romanticism, but toned up from Dandyism. They're still doing semi-communal living. They still got all the murals in their house. They're still using like medieval chairs and stuff, uh, which are cheap at the time because nobody wants medieval stuff. So you go to the, you can literally go to the thrift shop in 1835 and spend the equivalent of 10 bucks and get a chair from the 15th century to put in your apartment. It's cheaper than a new 1830 version of an Ikea chair, um, whatever that means. Um, so uh, they, one stuff they did do, they did DIY plays and comedy sketches in here, which is kind of interesting. Um, just out of their house. You know, these are all house shows. Um, and they did what the June France were not able to successfully do. They founded their own journal, their own magazine called L'Artiste, which became their way of interfacing with mainstream culture which is important, and also helped a lot of them to actually make a living as, a, as writers. Um, and then they, Gautier, here's one of their parties, not as crazy as the ones I described from a few years earlier, as you can see. The cult of art is really kind of what they found themselves on. This was found, this is uh, Théophile Gautier's idea, um, again, this guy from the Jeune France, all the way through here. The idea of the cult of art, um, is basically, if we now know it as art for art's sake, which is a bastardization of the idea that came through Walter Pater when he translated it into English. Um, that phrase is used once in the manifesto, whereas the term cult is used about five times. So it's basically formal experimentation here becomes more central to the avant-garde lifestyle. Um, and it is less about the emotionalism that you associated with some of the early Romanticism more about kind of the psychological and, and cultural um, meanings of, of this experimentation. And people were starting to get used to the idea, we're going to be an underground movement. We're, we're, gonna, we're not going to take over. The Romantics still were hoping to take over, and some of them did, which meant the avant-gardists were like, the avant-gardists who didn't get published were much more fucked up by it, I think. By this time, people are starting to figure out that we just have to get used to that. We're not going to win, but we can still persist. Um, and so, yeah. By the 1840s, Romanticism starting to, to go, to kind of die out as a movement. Um, the avant-garde doesn't have institutional support anymore, which means it doesn't have as many leaders that actually are able to do much, which means that com the community was really ravaged by poverty and suicide. A lot of people didn't, weren't able to publish. Their work is now lost. Um, and those who, who did not follow that fate, it's because they had to tone their work down in order to get it published and actually make a living. Um, at the same time, because Romanticism had now been so successful, successful as mainstream, the new kids coming up were like, what? Well, Romanticism's old hat. Like, this is what I need to rebel against, right? Which is reasonable. And so you even have neoclassicism coming back up again in the 1830, late 1830s with people being like, because people have grown up under a Romanticist hegemony. And so you've got a lot more different schools of thought now. The movement's so heterogeneous that they didn't all identify as Romantics anymore. The people who were doing more realistic stuff now call themselves realists. You've got the Bohemians, you've got the Parnassians, you've got the Dandies, and they all see themselves as different, not as Romanticist. So by another Victor Hugo play called The Burgraves, um, uh, in uh, 1842, that there was another battle like Hernani, but the Romantics lost because they could not. There was no underground community who would support them, and so that's kind of the point at which Romanticism ceases to really function as a social unit anymore. But all of those networks are still in place, so the avant-garde continues, but it's no longer Romanticism. 
And so that's what this chart kind of looks at. This is the way that Romanticism just kind of breaks into all these other movements by the end of the, the end of the, the, the century. Um, you got the Pre-Raphaelite Brotherhood, which is the first time that this community. We uh, this is all French because when we're talking about it as a community, it's all in one spot at this point. It's, it's a it's a local community. In the 1840s, you barely start moving outside of that. This is not the Pre-Raphaelite. Sorry. Uh, so the Pre-Raphaelites are based on Gautier's cult of art. Um, but Walter Peter, again, he kind of talks about it as art for art's sake. And whereas Gautier was kind of saying, if you want to change culture, politics isn't the level to do it on, Walter Peter makes it, let's not talk about politics just being pretty, which is not what it actually was. But this is how it kind of gets passed on into English consciousness. Um, so this was the first Anglophone community to consciously think of themselves as an extension of the community in Paris. In, in certain ways. Um, but they're mainly initiated through reading stuff, not through actually meeting a guy older than them who initiates them, which is also new, but today is how most people are initiated into the avant garde. Um, their structure is similar to the Romanticist structure, but there's more of a secret society <coughs> element in there. Um, more inspiration, a lot of inspiration from medieval Romanticism, um, and a lot of their community is really about handicraft and like rural life, which is very different from what we were seeing um, in Paris. Um, the creative process and books are basically sacred, which is essentially what Gautier is saying is a cult of art, is that like writing is a way to the divine. And then that is kind of expanded to painting and music and everything else. Um, let's see. How, how old were I? No, not yet. Okay. Early Bohemia. Like it. Let's see. Okay, Bohemia. <laughs> Um, so, the, you know, the, the, way, the way I've just described the romantics, oh, you can look at that and say, oh, that sounds like a pretty bohemian lifestyle. That literally is where bohemian lifestyle came out of. It was people emulating, or really just people continuing romanticist lifestyle. But, um, A, it gets bigger than the avant-garde. Um, bohemia is kind of a bigger field that parts of the avant-garde sit within. And also, there's not as much focus, um, I think, intellectually. Like, Bohemia is a little bit more about just having fun and doing what you want and being young and lo being loose. Whereas the Romantics, all of that was, was very much a, uh, in, in service to a goal of, that was very rigorous. Um, but the basic kind of lifestyle is, is essentially the same. Um, there's, uh, again, they tend to be organized into local clubs. Um, sometimes they're still called Senegals. Um, those are based at bars and cafes, not restaurants anymore. No spaghetti, no, we want some liquor. Um, so the Latin Quarter at this point is one that becomes the underground kind of center of Paris. Um, they're not using their homes as social spaces anymore. Salons are kind of out of favor. They're really using bars as their homes, and then they just like sleep at home. Um, Part of this is economic. I'm not sure how much of it. Um, so this is uh, this is a group. We don't know what the Senegal was called, but they met at the Prado apparently, which was a bar in Paris. I, that's all I've been able to figure out. Is that it was a bar. But there they are. All are showing their camaraderie. Um, uh, so um, yeah. Bonding activities for this community, singing and dancing and drinking. Above all, singing, dancing, and drinking are the big things. They live in dance halls and bars. Um, they're primarily youth, again, students and dropouts kind of who live on stipend or like little odd jobs who are, really do not want to be employed. Um, they're dressed pretty much like you would expect, kind of a combination of romanticism, romanticist shock, but uh, more working class. Um, kind of uh, budget feel about it. yes. Well, they both had that budget actually, but they were more they, they were more honest about their budget. <laughs> the romantics were trying to like make it pretty it up, you know. Um, yeah. So um, so you did have that um, again dancing. So here's with the dancing. Notice here, dancing was one of the few social spaces where people were not forced to conform to gender stereotypes with clothing. So here are two women in male dress dancing, uh, which may also imply other things that you were not uh, supposed to be doing at the time. 
Uh, and then here, this is a Shikar, who was one of the, the really famous kind of bohemian uh, romanticist dancer slash dance hall people. So this is quite a costume he's got here. Um, so, what's going on there? Um, so, yeah. Um, so, yeah, a lot, like I say, drinking, dancing, and all of that. But there was a lot of valorization of liquor. Um, I was talking about, like, for instance, Gerard de Nerval, who did eventually commit suicide. But it, you can look, and it was 30 years of his friends trying, 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 trying to help him. You don't see that nearly as much in Bohemia. What you see in Bohemia is people going, can you believe how much Verlaine can drink? Oh, yeah! And of course he dies of alcohol poisoning, miserable, poor, in a gutter. But that's Bohemia. Um, so Bohemia had some pretty dark sides to it. Um, which were precisely the sides that nobody wanted to really look at when it was going on. Um, there was a concept called blog, B-L-A-G-U-E, which is living for the moment, kind of just constantly partying, never worrying about the future, which of course only works for a certain amount of time. Um, Bohemia had a very complex relationship with popular culture. Um, Henry Merger, uh, who, I'm not gonna, anyway, a guy named Henry Merger, uh, wrote uh, Vida Bohem, which was a, a series of short stories about Bohemian life, which later became a uh, famous opera that I can't remember that sexual name of it. Was it? Was it? Le Bohem. Le Bohem. Okay. So, yeah, so that comes out of murder. Very valorized, kind of nice version of it. And uh, murder, some of the people who were in murder's own club later on came out against murder and were like, you're whitewashing this. That's way more political, but it's also way more complicated than what you're portraying here. Um, but a lot of people going into, into it, um, into Bohemia, were doing it because of looking at murder stories. Um, so a little bit later in the 19th century, as Bohemia progresses, as it, as it grows and kind of matures, um, it spreads to other metropolises, so like by the end of the century, you have big Bohemian communities in all the major European and American cities. Um, but there's not much connection between those. You don't have Bohemians in Paris corresponding with Bohemians in New York or Berlin, really. They're all local communities. Um, um, so, but it remains, really, Bohemia remains a part of most avant-garde movements really up to the present, especially into the 1950s and 60s. Um, so uh, a lot of the, a lot of them were involved with the Paris Commune in the 1870s. Um, after which, of course, the Paris Commune ended with three days of government troops slaughtering um, unarmed civilians in the streets. Um, so after that, the, po the straightforward political activism went down. After that, for kind of obvious reasons. Uh, but satire really took off, and so you get really a ton of really great bohemian satire in the second, you know, kind of last third of the 19th century. You have what's called fumism or smokism, which is based like good-natured pranks that are really, really complicated to pull, and that you pull the prank and then you tell everybody about it by publishing a story about it in your friend's newspaper. Um, the Bohemian clubs were way more comedic and satirical, but they're also much more focused. A lot of these later clubs ran newspapers, ran um, cabarets, so they were really doing a lot of work at the same time that they were that they were living like this. And there was a ton of overlap between these clubs. So this is an editorial meeting of the Chat Noir, and they're basically just all eating breakfast and drinking together and kind of hanging out while they read people's poems and figure out how it should go. It's, again, this combination of intellectual life and everyday life and friendship, um, camaraderie. Um, here's the early Chat Noir, but through a few different buildings. But you can look at like how much overlap there was. It was almost just like changing names. Uh, well, you can't see this very well from where you are. But these are each different groups. Look at Emile Godot is in four of these five groups. Charles Crow is in four of the five groups. Sapak is in every single one and on and on. So a lot of 
shared connections there. Um, they're slang again, kind of continuing with that very um, uh, really loves they love slang. This is a dictionary of uh, a dictionary of modern slang put out by the main publisher of the Shot Noir Bohemian Group. Um, and then you've got the contemporary Parnassus, which is almost the opposite. I'm, there's no way I'm going to get to medievalism, uh, but I'm going to go a little bit farther here. Um, contemporary Parnassus, which was an outgrowth of the cult of art. Um, basically, but what it does is, is the, the Parnassus is um, really put, it, it's not like Bohemia. They do have dinners together, they have salons, but mainly they're actually connecting each other through texts and through letters, it's becoming more of a network and people are mediating their interaction through texts. Um, so it's really kind of a step toward today's mail art network in a certain way. Um, and so Mende, uh, Coutil Mende was mentored by Théophile Gautier um, and then uh, basically becomes the primary organizer of this network through um, a journal called the Review Fantastiste, and then a uh, and then the Pronounce Contemporain anthology, which is a huge anthology with a bunch of poets who had a lot of different styles. So it's very diverse. Um, Mende actually married Gautier's uh, daughter, which also again shows you how closely these communities are tied. However, Gautier did not want him to marry uh, his daughter, and it turned out that he probably was right in this case because Katul Mende turned out to be a domestic abuser and she uh, left him within, I think, two or three years. So fuck that guy, but... Um, I can actually get into decadence, okay. Um, so that kind of moves us toward decadence and symbolism. I'm going fast here. Um, decadence and symbolism, which come about 1880s to 1910, this is kind of the bohemian You've got a bohemian wing of that, which is the Chat Noir and Alfred Jarry and people like that. Main mentors, and it's decadence of symbolism is really, it's two sides of the same coin in a sense. It's difficult to take those, really distinguish those two communities and not really worth doing in this context right now. Here are the main mentors of the symbolists, including two of them that we've already seen, Mende and Gautier. And then Stéphane Mallarmé, who's really actually the main kind of guy for the symbolist, who initiates most of them. And his salon, his weekly salon um, in Paris was kind of the social center of the symbolist community for, for years. Um, so, uh, yeah, decadence is a little bit more about lifestyle. Symbolism is a little bit more about kind of mystical. Decadence is more about, I guess, Decadence saw the avant-garde community as a symptom of the ills of mainstream society. So the decadents are kind of interesting in that they would kind of say, hey, look at how fucked up we are. What kind of society produces somebody like me? A fucked up society. So I, a little bit kind of like some strains of punk and metal in a way, in this deeply ironic, but also ironic in a way that isn't like hipster sarcastic because you can't say that about yourself without some ambivalence about who you are. <laughs> um, so this is kind of decadence thing. Symbolism is more about kind of the mysticism of creation. Um, not mutually exclusive, but different weight, you know, kind of different emphases. Daily life is pretty much built around artistic and textual meditation in these communities and intellectual work and rejecting commercial culture in every way you possibly can. Um, it's still network-based, but the salons at this point became more popular again. Um, salons kind of came, were, 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 became a bigger part of symbolist uh, stuff than they had been in, in for about a couple of decades. Um, uh, the avant-garde at this point is embracing its marginality. We're like, we're the weird ones, that's who we are. We're, that's, that is the way it is. Um, so this kind of alienation from the mainstream becomes part of the defining social experience, and really part of what, in a community where, what, the reason we're all a part of this community is because we're so different. The thing, one of the big things that helps, helped to connect people in that context was, we may all be different, but we all have that experience of not fitting in. 
And so that becomes kind of part of the emotional kind of underlay, which I think it always had been, but it becomes a much more conscious part of it with decadence. Um, let's see. Uh, there were, was some communal living, but not a whole lot. Um, Alfred Jarry did have a place called the Philanstery, which is a name, uh, along with Rashield and uh, Fred Vallette, we don't know. But, um, uh, but he called it the Philanstery, which is a reference to Fouillet's utopian socialism. Um, and you had the Nibi group, who lived communally out in the countryside for quite a while, for a couple years anyway. Um, big social events for the symbolists um, involved, uh, ugh, included, um, I'm out of order a little bit actually, just to say. Um, okay, so also symbolism is getting increasingly international. So at this point, finally, you're starting to get like an actual British symbolist community who get known as the, as the aestheticists, so like Oscar Wilde would be the, the best known, um, who consider themselves to be a part of the Paris, an extension of the Paris community almost. So there's a ton of interaction between those, those communities. Um, so that is a, that's a really big kind of thing. And you get a major symbolist communities also in Germany and in Belgium and in Eastern Scandinavia and in South America. Um, a lot more uh, communication and collaboration through the mail. And you had reading tours, lecture tours, and concert tours that would kind of connect these local groups that were developing around Europe. Um, the big social events, again, were salons, which become called evenings at this point. Um, and uh, big dinners with integrated readings and performances, not nearly as crazy as the Romanticist dinners, though. Um, there was a, a prince of poets that they would elect every so often, and they would have a big dinner for them, and everybody would pitch in some money. Berlin was the prince of, prince of poets at one point. Um, if you are going to be a decadent, how do you need to live? Um, and then also, sorry, funerals become big events. And so, uh, an avant-gardist dies, everybody in the community will pitch in money to buy them a big, nice gravestone in Montmartre. They even did this for Edgar Allan Poe, since the Americans had never given him a gravestone. The French found this out, and they were appalled, and so the French avant-garde is responsible for Poe having a gravestone, because nobody in America would do it. Um, and that was like 20 years after he died. So, uh, so funerals, cabarets, again, symbolist comedy becomes really big. Um, and so if you want to become a decadent, how do you, uh, let's see, Chat Noir again, Chat Noir again. Um, decadent symbols lifestyle. So you're, you're the, the decadents especially just applied the idea of decadence to everything. So they had a hyper dandyist approach to clothing and the way that they acted, like super dandyist. Their interior design, all of that was just like, what's the craziest way that we can conceptualize how we can do this? Um, uh, but really, it all focuses on oversaturation. I want to have so much going on, I can't even deal with it myself. Um, um, the most decadents, again, they were not wealthy, so there was a huge gap between what they wanted to do and what they could do when you're dealing with decadence. You're like, I don't have enough money to really be decadent, but I'm, I'm going to try. Um, so they would waste money whenever they could, even if they didn't have it to waste. Um, the men would have long hair, oiled and sculpted, and perfumed beards and mustaches that are all crazy, weird cuts to their clothing, very bright colors, not unlike the romantics. The woman would dress in Renaissance style, uh, Renaissance inspired dresses and hairstyles, and uh, uh, revived a uh, what's called a ferronier, which was a um, Renaissance headgear, which this lady here is wearing, where you've got like a little bead in the middle of your forehead for whatever reason. Um, so, yeah. Um, there was a, a specifically decadent disease called neuralgia. The idea was that they, within this community, people trained themselves to be hypersensitive in order to more fully appreciate art and literature and music. If I can hear, so they would train themselves to hear so well, at least this is what they would say, that, that they, they're, it was so rarefied that if they stepped out into the modern city with like buses rushing past and people shouting and hawking newspapers, that they would actually, have, like their, their nervous system would become overstimulated because it was like too finely tuned 
and they would just become nervous wrecks and collapse, and they would go like days, like, ugh, too much noise, I can't take it, my purified soul. But they called this neuralgia, um, and, and it was specific to the avant-garde as far as they were concerned. Um, they loved archaic words, again, this thing with like archaic language, they just loved. Um, and so they also, you had a whole decadent slang. And so here's a glossary of decadent slang um, from 1888, written by actually Paul Adam, who was one of the symbolist writers, um, to help you out in having a conversation with a decadent or understanding what they're writing. Um, homes were usually arranged, as, again, just as like crazy meditation chambers with way too much stuff packed into them from every possible place and time period you possibly could just throw it all in there. There's something kind of weirdly postmodern about decadence um, as well in that regard. Um, so like just, yeah, crazy juxtapositions. I'm going to cut it off there and not do the other hundred years, but we got the first hundred years <laughs> of the avant-garde there. So um, again, I will do this. I'm going to flip this thing around. I will leave this up here. If you want to get my lecture notes for the entire thing and the images, which have a lot more information that you can go through, just put your email down on here and I will send it to you like a week after the festival when I recover. That's what we got for now. Uh, Warren's going to do something soon. It should be more interesting. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>